I have been patient, Lord. I abide the presence of heathens, so there might be peace. And oaths were broken. I forgave. I even lined their pockets. But the Danes will not be sated. Enough! Patience is not thy will. It is the kingdom of Wessex! And my divine rule. Hello there everyone, and welcome to Thrones of Britannia. So, I gave you guys the choice of which faction to play, and you choose the English Kingdoms. And, I mean, you can play as Mercia, but why would you play as Mercia when you can play as Vesex and Alfred the Great? Um, I've set up the diff difficulty accordingly, so very hard for battles and campaigns since I'm a veteran Total War player. However, since I mostly play Empire and Napoleon, I'm not too familiar with the political strategies and stuff like that. So I've gone ahead and set that difficulty to normal. Um, to say a little bit more, I guess Wessex is the easiest kingdom to play as since we have uh, one of the largest territories. And as you can see, I also have six vassals, vassals all over the place. However, about half of these are Welsh factions and are not particularly loyal. So we might have to properly subjugate the Welsh. With that said, let's go ahead and jump straight into the campaign, shall we? Long have the Vikings raided our lands, but nothing prepared us for their great army. For a decade we fought them, the tide of battle ebbing back and forth. Until finally they were defeated, and their great army fled our lands. Now, England lies divided, its old political order washed away. Too long have we fought amongst ourselves. Now is the time to unite as England. And so with that introduction done, here we have the man himself, Alfred the Great. Or I guess at this point he's not actually great yet. The point is that we are going to make him Alfred the Great by uniting England. Um, so in the beginning there I talked a little bit about some uppity Welsh people uh, that were uh, not too happy being my vassals. And uh, looking at the uh, strategic map here we can see that I've got two of them here. But then I also got Cornwall which um, I guess they're Celtic enough so that they're uh, also a part sort of of the, the Welsh in a sense. Or they've this, the same kind of Celtic people. Uh, or similar enough. Um, so we, these three are my vassals that are not too loyal. Um, and then I have the three others which are loyal, which are Kent, Sussex, and Devon. Um, talking about the Welsh, the Welsh are not our, our uh, main adversary though, since the entire sort of historical uh, campaign revolves around the fact that we have been invaded by the Norsemen. The Danish, the Dane law has come in and they've taken a big chunk out of England. So the big two kingdoms to watch out for, big two Danish kingdoms, are Northumbria up here, which we can see hold quite a bit of territory up here. 
and then the east angles, which are the ones we actually bother with, and then there's a smaller uh, Viking kingdoms in between, and I don't think I have to go through the Irish or the Scottish, because we probably won't be fighting them that much. Um, with that said, these guys are obviously our main adversaries, but there will be events where other Viking raiders come to uh, to uh, g get there, see if they have any luck in uh, raiding our land. So they will turn up on the borders here and just raid, which is going to be a problem because in the newer Total Wars you have these provinces that don't have any garrison or anything at all, so they'll just go in and take them which can upset quite a lot. You'd imagine that maybe not a small town like this is that much. Um, wouldn't matter that much if they took it, but there's some added uh, um, like food, and there's some added uh, abilities, or not abilities, features, like food, so you have to feed everyone, which I actually think is an interesting feature, um, with supplies as well, which is one of the things that I've actually been thinking about if they would do a another musket uh, sort of um, total war that it would be interesting if you have to make sure that you have a supply line uh, like you have to secure roads like roads would become more important in future total wars where you would uh, draw make special roads uh, just for military use uh, that you sort of prioritize certain areas so if you know if you have a city that is like the military hub then you want good roads up to the front or I mean if it's in um, in uh, like um, in the same time period it's uh, fall of the samurai you would prioritize maybe making railroads uh, for uh, war effort as uh, and not only for trade uh, with that said we start off here with Alfred the Great, and Learn we've got a uh, the mission you always get to beat up some rebels. So we got some rebels here in one of my areas. We're not going to spend that much time actually looking into what you need to build and stuff, but there's a lot of interesting new features that um, I haven't really been... Uh, since I haven't played a lot of the total, newer Total Wars, most of the times you guys just want me to play Napoleon Total War and Empire, so there's a lot of interesting new features and stuff we'll have to go through um, the main thing is for you guys I guess is to know the political situation which I've gone over with the Danes and so forth one thing that I didn't actually say is that our main adversary which is of course the East Anglians uh, with Guthrun as their commander if you have seen uh, the uh, the series um, the last kingdom then you have kind of uh, I, I should even maybe recommend you at least watch the first season to kind of get an idea of the political situation and sort of a bit of the history behind that. Um, I, it was quite a time since I watched watched The Last Kingdom, but I remember it, it was kind of okay. Uh, the only thing that I didn't really like was the main character because he seemed like such a... He didn't think through anything. He just... I feel this. This is what I'm going to do. And it, most of the time it blew up in his face. Um, right, so yes, what I was talking about in the uh, before I get sidetracked, they're talking about the Last Kingdom, is that uh, right now, as per the history of this, since this is sort of a this is well set in the history setting, but uh, with the current time, which is 878 AD, uh, means that we have, as we can see here, a treaty. The, the Treaty of Alfred and Guthrun turns remaining 20. The peace signed between these two leaders are still in effect, keeping relations between these two nations cardinal for now. So at this point we are at peace and we kind of have 20 turns, I imagine, then, to build up before we can uh, go ahead and declare war with each other, which was something that I didn't realize first time I did kind of a test playthrough. And I wondered, why can I, I not declare not war on these guys? Today. But there we have the answer for that. There we have Guthrun. Um, and yeah. With that said, let's go have our first battle here and fight the, uh, <laughs> the rebels. And then for next episode, I think I will do most of the building and stuff uh, off camera. And then we'll concentrate on 
what I will do next. So I have two possibilities for military campaigns, I'm thinking. Um, or three options, really, I think. So we have this smaller uh, Viking Kingdom, which we can... Um, I'm pretty sure we can cut down. It would possibly provoke Guthrun to break the agreement and we could get into all-out war with the Vikings. But this is really the only border I have with the um, the Vikings, so along here. And since I'm at peace with Guthrun through this special treaty, I can't actually declare war on him. So this is the only Viking I can go against. Also, we have the options of subduing our own vassals, so Cornwall which Not is possible. really unhappy with me. I think he's even got a trait that he hates the English. Um, so we could see about subjugating them and uh, basically taking over their territory, incorporating it in our kingdom. And then the third option is to um, is part of ally ally becoming allied with Mercia, because the Mer Mercia and the Welsh will start off fighting. In the beginning here and in my test playthrough Mercia did not fare that well they kind of got overrun by the Welsh so they could possibly need aid and it could be nice to secure sort of my left flank um, before actually fighting the Viking horde I imagine the Vikings is probably a harder nut to crack than the Welsh but yeah, with that said, let's go ahead and have Three our first battle. So power. we're going to have uh, the Swine Array. Now, not really a great name, is it? So, um, bef um, to the next episode, I would like you guys to actually come up with a different name for this army. So instead of the Swine's Array, we would rename it to something we more fitting. The, the second army that I have is called, let's see... Can I click on it? There we go. The Resolute Wall. Uh, so I think that's a more fitting name. We, will so we would have something here. They, these are early Christians. So you can think of different kinds of like Christian names. We are the mm -hmm, defenders of the faith or whatever. We are the strong Anglo-Saxons. I, I can't think of anything right now. But hopefully you can think of a good name for this army. Maybe inspired of what they do in the field. Now I've talked way too much. Let's go ahead and smite these rebels and uh, make sure that everyone knows that Alfred is not someone who will take uh, treachery like this um, without a fight. Do not falter. So it's a rather even fight, as we can see here, by the. Um, the uh, balance meter, but also by the fact... Display detail of preview the battle. Oh! Oh! I like this. This I like. Okay, maybe not. Because this is a very crude map. But we can see that... Okay, I'm imagining... But okay, so this is basically flat. We've got a road going through. There's some forested areas. But, I mean, it's something... I like this feature. This is what, something I would want would want in Napoleon or Empire or if they in introduce a new such uh, such a game uh, that you could see this. The thing is though um, this is um, kind of too late to do anything so I would maybe want a more detailed so you, maybe you can get certain details. I mean you get certain details like the bridges so if you stand on the bridge the enemy will have to cross a bridge to fight you but more details like that on the map to make it clear that, you know what, this area right here is probably a good place to hold your army. Because most time you just, it, unless it's a bridge battle, you just meet them anywhere and uh, you don't know, maybe the high ground is on your side, maybe the high ground is somewhere else, you know. So it would be interesting to maybe have something like that where you can actually tell that. But I, but I like this feature. I didn't... I'd notice this right now, which is kind of... Yeah, I haven't played this a lot. Um, so the only difference in between our two armies, which are uh, basically pound for pound the same, with levies and stuff, is that they have a levy axeman, and I have some actual retinue swordmen. And I think also... Yes, also we can see here that my general has 160 units while his general is 100. So we have numbered them by 60 men. So we've got that in our advantage. 
So, uh, this should be rather an easy fight. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and have this fight, shall we? Let's bring the fight to the rebels and slay them all. Alfred and his men marches into battle. And uh, we've got the enemy right across here. Uh, what I've gone ahead and done... Ah, oh, damn it. They actually switched position. What I need is for the spearmen to be on that side because we've got enemy cavalry over there. Um, we're going to drag the lines as long as possible. One thing that I don't actually like is that every time you click them to move somewhere, they're out to run. I think I have to go into the settings to disable that because that's not very useful if you're hiding in a forested area. So right quickly here, the plan is basically to march straight on them and cut them down, but uh, I've placed my spearmen, obviously to counteract their horsemen. Uh, I've put my archers here to kind of get these guys to um, move away and uh, sort of have the archer fight po probably sort of back and forth over this area instead and leaving the infantry to march straight on to there and then I have the cavalry to swing around here we as fire. well. Hopefully the AI um, is stupid enough to just charge Your straight ahead. So look at that, if I click them to move forward they immediately start to run which I don't like. But the first thing, first things first, we're gonna get the archers to get into a fight. One thing that I have noticed is the morale system, I think, is a little bit askew. Because, I mean, levies, once the general die, there's no point for the levies to actually be in the battle. Like, they have nothing to gain, really, once the general is dead. And there's no, like, system where, you know, other units have sort of noble commanders or anything like that. So, so many times I've actually been uh, defeated by the enemy just due to the fact that their levy archers uh, sort of kited me to victory, which is such a shit way to lose, isn't it? Um, and also one thing that I noticed is that the uh, toggle guard mode is kind of a little bit broken as well, because a... Um, because it's so many times they actually kind of didn't it was it's weird we'll see if it actually happens again but they kind of didn't even fight back in a weird sense so at this point I've actually got a pretty good position I think where I can move in uh, on the flank here and just hit have my two units hit their one archer unit so that is what we're going to do and we're going to be able to concentrate all our fire on this one unit. And it we even moves to counter our move. Uh, which means that we will actually be the ones to get our arrows... Oh. To get our arrows off first. And we lost one man to their actually losing four. And you can see the AI, they have a trouble. They have really big trouble kind of figuring out how to fight here. A little bit weird how they sort of stop on a dime the archers and fire back at us uh, which seems rather strange but at this point we're closing in and uh, you know what let's get the spearmen up front to block the cavalry and then have our two general units or our two uh, swordman units move forward the cavalry ready to swing around and uh, yeah should be going very well. Could even hit these guys in the flank at this point. So we're gonna tell the general to charge in on this and the retinue things to charge in over here and we're gonna see about getting the spearmen to attack the horsemen. At this point the enemy archers are leaving and we're able to hit these guys in the flank which is just perfect. We're gonna get a bit closer, and at this point, they have. They're m even moving their spearmen back, and they're charging the cavalry in a weird way. And now the cavalry will be locked into battle with my spearmen attacking them in the back, which gives my cavalry free movement on their shitty archers. 
And now it's just down to uh, whoever fights the longest, whoever writes out the fight. So my general has already been able to kill off those guys. We're gonna swing around here. My cavalry is just riding over, riding down everything. And at this point, it's only the enemy general left. And let's see how he fights. See if we can spot him here in among the fighting. And maybe get some cool animations as they cut people's heads off and stuff. Uh, we have a runaway horse. I'm hoping the others can uh, continue the fight without me uh, commanding them. Maybe not so great to fire ar fire arrows into this while uh, while we still have man this close. I can't really see any uh, anyone dying just now. I guess I'm, I'm missing all the cutting off of heads. But you can see at this point, we have completely surrounded them. So the, uh, the spearman has come up to surround them. And, uh, oh, is that an enemy archer unit? Yes, it is. And my cavalry unit is just watching them. Oh, the general is given up. And he's running. Cut his head off, the bloody traitor. Oh, and there comes the cavalry back. But it's too too little too late at this point. They are lost. And now he's even dead. And the fear spreads through the ranks. We've got a single archer. Single levy archer. He will count his lucky star that he was able to get away and no one's hopefully got a clue who he is. He can just go back to his farm um, without too much <laughs> repercussions. He's the only one out of 80 men that survived. The rest of them all slaughtered. So pretty good fight here. Um, lost some levy archers but who the hell cares about stupid levies? Um, or maybe I should actually care about them because they are my workforce. So who is there to toil the field when uh, the troops have died? And I think that is also part of the mechanics of this mod. Because uh, levies were so important during this time period for raising troops, especially for the English kingdoms, that uh, if um, you're losing too many men or in battle and stuff like that or if the war goes on for too long and you don't have decisive victories and stuff like that then your populace will be unhappy now when I test played this campaign I never played it long enough to actually see this happen but I did play some uh, Viking test plays and when I did that uh, I had quite a bit of rebellions from different lords and stuff. So this will be an interesting playthrough. With that said, let's go back to the campaign map, shall we? Right, a decisive victory. I only lost 87 men out of my 700 men army, which is very good. I think in my test play, I lost 100 men, so it's certainly an improvement. The enemy had only 27 men remaining, which is a lot better than I did during my test play. What we're going to do is, I mean, the replenishment, I don't think I'm going to need the replenishment, so we'll just take the gold. Get marching, One man. thing, though, that's actually kind of bad with me being able to we so thoroughly course. destroy the force was that, obviously, for each battle you play, uh, your general gets more experience and uh, you can actually drag this fight out to be two fights. So you have the first fight where you destroy them and or defeat them, I should say, not, hopefully not destroy them. And then the second one where the remnants retreat roughly about here, you follow them and you smite them again. Obviously giving your general more experience, so he'll gain more points and so forth. And having an experienced 
king and general is very important. And uh, yeah, let's go ahead and just take a look at the skills here. I'm not gonna linger too much here. One thing to notice is, uh, I mean, they have limited to 10. So 10 is what they display, but you can actually have more than 10. So in this fact, um, Alfred actually got 13. Uh, so even though you uh, they only display 10, they probably should have maybe increased that because he had, he I, I in my test play I managed to get it up to he had 18 influence. Um, he's already got scribe, but we're gonna take since it was during a battle. I think we're gonna go ahead and take champion. However, it might be better to have something like maybe priest to spread faction allegiance. Loyalty is not that important. Public order, uh, local enemy province could be possibly good. Um, pillager, I don't think we're going to pillage a lot. Since we're in English kingdom, we're going to try to take back as much land as possible from the Vikings. Bard could be good with replenishment, but for this one, we'll take champion. The men are ready to serve. And with that, I think this will be the end of the first video. Hopefully you guys will enjoy this. I will probably do quite a few turns uh, before we do the next video and I'll have to explain or I'm not entirely sure how I will cover uh, the long periods without conflict where I'll try to cover the sort of intrigues of court life because uh, in this uh, compared to uh, the normal uh, Total Wars I play Empire and Napoleon which you most want me to play um, there's not really a family tree and there's a lot of intrigues here with, for instance, uh, right now we've got my brother, my deceased brother's son as the heir to the throne, while Alfred actually got a direct descendant here, Edward, one of his own sons, uh, that should really be uh, the heir. And that's something, if you watched The Last Kingdom, you kind of uh, had that... Um, that plot line as well. I only watched first season, so I didn't really know where they brought that, but um, that that's one of the things you can do. And one of the other things you can do, which I did in my test play, I married off his sister to the King of Mercia. The King of Mercia was killed in the battle against the Welsh, and so I inherited uh, Mercia. However, I did not get them as I took control of everything, Instead, they ha basically became uh, vassalized. She is, however, not a great sale because um, she is demanding. I mean, if you marry her off to anyone but the uh, king, uh, you can see how minus two loyalty for the husband is maybe not that great of a trait. Uh, influence and seal, however, is pretty good. Um, but yeah, loyalty, not that great. And we also have a lot of uh, estates and stuff, so we'll have to keep check on all these uh, noble people. One thing that I uh, found out, which was pretty cool, is you got the estates. So you can grant estates and stuff. And normally, it's, I think it's best to actually keep them with the king. Because that's usually just positive uh, uh, things. Or I guess, maybe not, it's due to what the skill of the actual person. But some of these skills, like for this guy, Broderick, he has a agricultural estate, and that actually gives me less food per turn, which, I mean, Tem, that's, that's basically being able to feed one less infantry unit than normally. Um, so uh, giving out a lot of those that give minus like that is probably not a good idea, but you have to balance that with keeping the loyalty of your governors. So I've gone through a bit of the different mechanics that are new to this which I think is necessary given that most of the time this channel just features uh, Empire and Napoleon but uh, yeah I don't think I'm gonna be holding you any longer so I'll leave you with um, really what My should I rename this army to? The Swine Array is I mean is that befitting for the army of the king? to be called a swine array? Um, I'm not so sure. Maybe it is historical and 
you can like read something into it other than the you know pigs pigs lined up I don't know um, but yeah I'll leave you with that try to figure out a new name for the king's army and uh, as I always say hopefully you guys enjoy this and hopefully I'll see you guys for the next one bye <laughs>